Uh, we are going to continue um, the celebration of disciplines. We're combining worship and celebration together. If you're in a small group, though, I have to tell you that there's this is going to be, and it's also Easter, so there's going to be more Easter in here probably than even Foster and his celebration of discipline. Um, it's such an important day for us. Um, and the Easter lilies that, that come to remind us that God is, and he is waiting on us to grow and to blossom into something beautiful. So but let, me, let me start out with, with Foster this morning. Nope, not yet. Not, not you, Chuck. <laughs> As Foster said this. Uh, he, he said, when more than one or two come into public worship with a holy expectancy, it can change the atmosphere of the room. I'm going to read that again because I think this is really, really something that we sometimes forget about. When more, more than one or two come into public worship with a holy expectancy, what does that mean to you? Not rhetorical. <laughs> Be happy. Be happy. A holy expectancy. What is that? Participate. Yeah. The anticipation. Yeah. And, and anticipation that God is going to do something. When we walk through the doors, it's not just church. We're coming together with a holy expectancy about what is God going to do this morning. Hmm? Go forward. Don't look back. Yeah, we are going forward. So we have a holy expectancy, or we can have a holy expectancy when we enter and if we do, it'll change the whole worship service if everyone were to come with that expectancy. When Sunday morning is not about the music, the message, or the food, but only about expecting to encounter the living God in worship, then we'll see worship in new and dynamic ways. Because it's not about what we get out of worship. It's what we bring to worship. You know, so often we come, well, you know, the pastor, I didn't get anything out of that message. Well, the music just wasn't quite right. I didn't get anything out of the music. And my question would be, what did you bring? What did you bring to worship? Worship is an interesting thing, and, and some of y'all are familiar with a gentleman named Chuck. Chuck knows church. I've shown this before, but he does this so well. I'm going to show it again. You ready, guys? Hey, what do you think is the most important thing we do as a Christian congregation? Sell tickets to Sunday's car wash? Plan services around the NFL schedule? Or serve up something better than tuna noodle casserole at the church potluck? Well, as important... <laughs> As that last one is, it is not the most important thing we do as a church. For those of you who said worship, ding, 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 winner, winner, chicken dinner, worship is the most important thing we do, the most important oh, action we take as a Christian congregation because of what worship means. So what does worship mean? Sounds like that's what we're talking about, worship, on this episode of Chuck Knows Church. Oh, no. That beats per minute is down. <laughs> so, what is so important about worship, you say? This uh, all-important action that we take as a Christian congregation. Why all this stretching? Ooh, I can feel that in my glutes. Oh, all the stretching and, and uh, warm-up. And what does it have to do with worship? Follow me. Well, the word worship comes from the old Anglo-Saxon word, worthon. Worthon. To declare how much something is worth. Worthon. Pronounced worthon. <laughs> yeah, Chuck Norris has nothing on me. Worthon. <laughs> All right. Ooh, I think I pulled my rotator cuff. Ah, the actual old English spelling was written and pronounced 
worthship. Worthship. Try saying that five times real fast. Worthship, 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 worthship. That just rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. It's too difficult, right? So I know. Hey, let's just clean up that funky spelling, make it easier on the old twisted tongue. So we did. And when I say we did, I mean they did long before I was born. Ah, so they cleaned it up and the word became worship. Worship. Also important to remember, worship is an action. <laughs> now you're getting it. A-C-T-I-O-N. Action. That's what the early Christians thought anyway. Just check out these three Greek words from the New Testament, uh, which all mean worship in English. They are sebomai, meaning to lift up high or to exalt. Proskuneo, meaning to bow down. And latrevo, meaning to serve. That's right. Verbs. Three virtually unpronounceable verbs. <laughs> yes, action words, meaning worship is not something we attend, but something we do. <clears throat> And these three Greek words, they all go together to lift up, to bow down, and to serve. All ways we act out our worship, all ways that we worship God. Action words, remember. So, reach up for Sebamai, bow down for Proskuneo, and then reach out for Latrevo. Okay? Uh, again, up and down and out and up and down and out and up and down and out and up and up and down and up. My form was excellent on that. <laughs> I'm gonna just rest for a second. It's not so much this as much as the whole thing. Can someone give me a medic or something? <laughs> I, I'm good, actually I'm good. Ah, too many, uh, too many pancakes is all. <clears throat> and uh, despite all the worship calisthenics, what? our original meaning is still there. To declare how much something is worth. And at the top of our worth chart, no, not money or chocolate chip pancakes or even the church potluck. Of course, it's God. And that's why worshiping God is the most important action. Do an action. <laughs> it's the most important action that we take. I'm gonna sit down for this last bit, if that's okay. All right, if you would like to learn more, ask your pastor. Tell them Chuck sent you. Pal. Thank you. That's that's good. Nope. I think one was. One was enough. Now I need two towels. <laughs> Thank you. Did I look like Rocky in that first part? Worship is an action, right? It's an action. We too often turn it into a noun, but it's not passive. It's, it's an action that we take. It's not just coming to church once a week or once a month or once a year, but it's a daily endeavor. It's a daily action that we take. It's, it's it, whether, whatever kind it is, whether it's Sebamai, which is to lift up, right? And what was this one? Proskuneo or Latrevo. Sebamai, Proskuneo, Latrevo. And that's really a good exercise if you did that a whole bunch of times in the morning. It, it, would, it would get you going. Um, but I have a robe on, so I'm going to pretend like that's why I can't keep going. <laughs> but we're to live lives of worship. Lives of worship, lives that show God clearly to others, and in doing so, shows it also to ourselves. And how do we do that? Well, I'm going to be back in a, briefly in a familiar passage, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. I appeal to you. He's appealing. He's, he's begging. He's, he's, caught, he's encouraging. He's wanting people to get this part. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. When we do that, that's our spiritual worship. Worship, when we bring all of us to the table and we turn it over to God and we say, okay, God, here I am. 
Send me. Help me. Lift me. Show me where it is that you would have me to be. He didn't stop there. Do not be conformed to the world, right? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Anybody got a journal? It might be in the front of that. And the reason for that is that then we can, by testing, we can discern what the will of God is, what's good and acceptable and perfect, what that his will is. So one is become a living sacrifice. That's just living your life for God. It's a living sacrifice because you're going to sacrifice things from the world in order to follow him. Don't give in to the world. Don't conform to the ways of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which means change our thinking. Foster opened his chapter on the di discipline of worship with this quote. To worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, and to devote the will to the purpose of God. It's by a gentleman named William Temple. Worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, feed the mind with the truth of God, purge the imagination by the beauty of God, open the heart to the love of God, and to devote the will to the purpose of God. You have a purpose. You have a calling in this place. You know, every one of you in here, all of us have a calling. Foster continues to say, to worship is to experience reality, to touch life. It's to know, to feel, to experience the resurrected Christ in the midst of the gathered community. It is a breaking into the Shekinah of God, the presence of God, or better yet, being invaded by the Shekinah of God, God's, God's holiness, his, his, his glory. Shekinah means the glory of God, the radiance of God, having that break into our lives, break into our church. Break into our work. Break into our schools. Break into everything that we do. We want the Shekinah, the glory, the presence, the radiance of God to move us. And when we enter into worship, our desire needs to be, I hope it is, to experience that presence. To be part of God's movement on this planet of ours. To, to come here going, man, what is God going to do today? You know, we... we we, we talk about, you know, splitting the pulpit in two. He hadn't done it yet. But, man, how cool would it be if he does? You know? If he came in, and, and, and he just did something miraculous. Now, we do get to see that from time to time. Lives change in this place. Why? It's not because of the music. We love our music. It's certainly not the message. <laughs> you know? It's God. It's God breaking in and changing our hearts. And by the way, God is all about worship. John 4, 23, the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such the Father seeks to worship him. He seeks to worship him, those who worship in spirit and in truth. He's seeking worshipers who are going to do that, who are going to enter in. And it's always been that way. God's like the father of the prodigal son, right? He's out at the gate. He's looking down the road. He's in anticipation something's going to happen today. One of my kids is going to come home today. I don't know which one. One of them's going to come down that road. And when I see him, I'm going to run out. And I'm going to be, I expect him to come or her to come. Come. I'm waiting on you. I'm ready for you. Enter into my presence. I'll kill the fatted calf. I'll put a robe on you, a ring on your finger. Just come expectantly waiting on what God will do. You know, he's, he's looking down the road. And, and guess what? If there's only one coming down the road, you know what he does? He goes to get the one, regardless of the 99 that are already there. He goes to get the one. He goes to get you if you're the only one. So much he loves you. So much he wants to be in relationship with you. That's why that whole parable of the shepherd who left the 99 sheep to go get the one is in the Bible, I think. It's to let you know. If you're the one, I'm looking. You're not alone. I'm coming to get you. See, worship is our response to God seeking us out. He gives us the greatest gift there is in his son, Jesus. 
He gives us the greatest gift there is in his son, Jesus. Ah, there it is. You know what he does? He gives us the greatest gift there is in his son, Jesus. Isn't that awesome? You know, his son, he gives to us, he gives us the opportunity for eternity. How grateful is, are we to have that? But it's more than that. That's a preposterously impossible, costly gift. But he does, it's not just eternity. This, this idea of worshiping in spirit and in truth, living lives filled with gratitude to the one who did these things for us, we don't earn anything. We don't need to earn anything. He did it all. He did it all. We strive to become like him because of the gratitude that we have for what was done for us. It's not to gain, not to gain brownie points. It's not, look at what I've done. It's in gratitude. And that's what we remember. That's what we celebrate on Easter, right? We did it this morning, right, Michael? Celebrate Jesus. Yeah, we've done it so much, some of us groan at that song. <laughs> oh, not that one. And then we start singing it and go, yes, yeah, celebrate Jesus. You know, because the message is so strong. We start out with an oh, no, and end with a hey, man. <laughs> it's just kind of the way it works. Hear this. Do you need to be forgiven? God's saying come. Do you need to be comforted? God's saying come. Do you need to be held? God's saying, come. You know what? One of the biggest reasons I raised my hand, I haven't done this in a while, and most of y'all have been here a while, too. But when I raised my hand, some of y'all are parents and grandparents, right? What happens when your kid or your, or, or your grandchild does this? You pick them up. Sometimes I need to be picked up. Sometimes my life has be, just beat me up. Sometimes I just need God. Hold me for a minute. I don't have it in me anymore. I'm done. But when I do that, something special happens. And he picks me up. Do you need to be loved? Yeah. Come. Come. Bring yourself to the altar of God and give yourself so that others may experience that which makes you so grateful for this day. I talk about being a witness. And I always ask the same question, so I'll ask the same question. What does it mean to be a witness? What do witnesses do? Testify to what they have seen, heard, and experienced of God. That's, that's being a witness. You wanna, you know, you're never going to save anybody, by the way. Okay, I don't know if you didn't know that. I'm not either. <laughs> you know who saves? God. God saves. However, we have a testimony. We have a message. We have a story to share with those we come in contact with. And if we share what we have seen, heard, and experienced of God, God takes that and does miraculous things with it. You know? Bring yourself to the altar. You know, that Asbury went up there, to, as, as you all know, went up to Asbury. I'm not going to talk about that other than this. What started that thing was a confession, prayer and confession among some college kids, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew. It grew so much that a town of 6,000 people had 30,000 people there one day, you know? Confession, true confession leads to the heart of God. You know, it, it's helpful to, to, to confess to a person that you trust but at least confess to God, by the way, God already knows. He's not shook up by anything that you've done. He's not going, Dolores, no! <laughs> oh, that's right. Rick, no! <laughs> There's nothing you've done that has shaken up God to his core. Oh, my gosh, I can't believe that he did that. It didn't happen. God knows. My goodness. Adam and Eve screwed up the whole planet. <laughs> and what did he do with them? He loved them anyway. He called to them, where are you? It wasn't because he didn't know where they were, by the way. <laughs> he wanted them to know that he knew something was different. 
And they were hiding like we tend to hide. Let me encourage you to not, don't try to hide from God. One, it won't work. But two, we need him. You know, we need that forgiveness. We need that touch that can only come from him. And confession is how that happens. Confess, and true confession leads to the heart of God. I'm convinced of that. I've read about revivals over time. Every one of them that is significant started with prayer and confession. Confession that we don't have it. We aren't enough and we need God. And that heart filled with forgiveness and with love reaches out to us and changes us. Because we're his kids. Mark 12, 30 says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. God's priority is to be first in our lives, and he's calling us to worship. And hear this as well. How we worship is not the point. We, there's this thing that it's not, I don't think, as bad now as it used to be. Uh, it's called the worship wars. But whether your style is high worship with choirs and and, and uh, if you've been to Peach, every time I do that, I think of Peach Tree Road, United Methodist Church. They have this, this organ. You, have you seen those organs? That's the whole stage all the way to the roof. And it's beautiful. And, the, and when they play it, it's awesome. And for some people, that's, that's how you worship. That's, that's how you do this. That's how you enter in. You robes on the choir, robes on the preacher, stained glass all around. That's the way it's supposed to be, Right? Other people worship in quiet with little or no music. Some have none. They just a cappella. And they sing anyway. And they contemplate the words of Scripture with one another. Or it could be loose, a looser feel for the process of worship. You preach, you wear jeans and T-shirt. You have a church band that plays. Or it can be something else. No one way triumphs another. Enter into worship as you will. God will meet you there, and if you encounter the living God, you cannot help but be changed. The process are all designed to help us get to the throne. That's where our worship is directed. In fact, every discipline we've studied in the Celebration of Discipline uh, book, every one of them is, is about the outcome. It's not about the, about the, the discipline. It's about drawing nearer and nearer and nearer to God so that we might please him in this world of ours. We need to practice the presence of God. That's where Chuck was dead on. Worship in action. Sebomai. To lift up. To exalt. Proskuneo. To bow down before him. Latrevo. To serve. Those are three aspects you can worship while you're serving on missions. It's a way to worship. You can worship everywhere that you go. You can lift up high and exalt God. Some days you get, wake up and the sunrise just blows you away. You know, that's it. Oh, my God. I just exalt you, Lord. And sometimes we got to come with humility before him. But it's all worship. It's all worship. So how do we do it, right? Well, Foster has some ideas he borrowed from a guy named Frank Laubach and Brother Lawrence. I'm going to read this if I can. It was easier when it was back there. The trouble with nearly everybody who prays is that he says amen and runs away before God has a chance to reply. Listening to God is far more important than giving him our ideas. Wow. I do that sometimes. Well, Lord, I hear it, blah, 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 and then I'm off. Listen. Laubach also said this. He said, of all today's miracles, the greatest is this, to know that I find thee best when I work listening. Thank thee, too, that the habit of constant conversation grows easier each day. I really do believe all thoughts can be conversations with thee. The thoughts that we have, we can be in constant conversation with God. It's a habit. It's a practice. It's a discipline. Brother Lawrence, we've talked about him in here many times. I can't imagine how religious persons can live satisfied without the practice of the presence of God. Those who have come and tasted the Shekinah glory of God in daily experience can never again live satisfied without the practice of the presence of God. 
And it's a different take on, lead, uh, on, on the leader of worship as well. Because it's not me and it's not Mike. You know who the leader of worship is? Jesus. Yeah, you're right, Lynn. It's Jesus. Jesus is. George Fox says this. He said, meet together in the name of Jesus. He is your prophet, your shepherd, your bishop, your priest. In the midst of you to open you to, and to sanctify you and to feed you with life. And to quicken that life. Jesus can show up in lots of different ways, and he does. Are we seeking him this morning? Did you come in going, man, I need me some of that. I need the Holy Spirit to come and to fall upon me fresh this morning. Are we seeking him this morning? Is the world trying to blot out your head even now as you're sitting you're going, well, I've got this and I've got that and I've got this and, and that's the enemy trying to distract you from what God has for you here. Enter in to worship. Worshiping in spirit and in truth will require us to reorder our expectations from what is being done for me to what can I do for him? We become a consumer church in a lot of, in a lot of ways. And it's not what we consume. And look, we need to be built up. We need edification. We need to come together to get built up so we can go out there and live as a Christian. And that takes work sometimes. We need this time. But we're not here primarily to be filled we're here primarily to praise and worship and exalt the one who deserves it. St. Augustine said, the Christian should be an alleluia from head to foot. Alleluia is an interesting word because it's really two words. It's halal, which means sing praise to. Halal, yah, which is the short for God. Halal, yah, hallelujah, is simply saying, I sing praise to you, Lord. Hallelujah from head to foot. That's all of our body. That's all that we are and is to be. And hallelujah from head to foot. And celebrating our faith that's coming together is really important. Nehemiah, he's the one who rebuilt the, the wall. Miraculously, he was... He was <laughs> he, he was shocked that they let him go, <laughs> but, the, but he got let go to, to, to build the, law, the, the wall it back up. Nehemiah 8.10 says, Go and enjoy choice foods and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy for the, our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. What's your strength? The joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. So everything has to be going right in my life in order for me to have joy, correct? What? It is, well, if things are going bad and, 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 and not going my way, that's not joy. I can't have joy in that, can I? You have the joy of the Lord. Yeah, I may not be happy. <laughs> joy is a choice. Joy is something that we choose. We can choose joy in the midst of the most difficult of circumstances, and many of you in here have done that. Once you've done it once, guess what? It becomes easier to do after that because you know God's going to see you through. It doesn't matter what happens. God's going to see you through it. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Foster says it this way. He says, discipline of celebration is central to all the spiritual disciplines. The discipline of celebration is central to all of the spiritual disciplines. Without a joyful spirit, the disciplines become dull, death-breathing tools in the hands of modern Pharisees. Every disciple should be characterized by carefree gaiety and a sense of thanksgiving, being grateful, grateful, living into this joy. Do you know that joy is a fruit of the Spirit? Did you know that? You did? Are you sure? How sure are you? You need a reminder, don't you? Yes. The fruit of the Spirit is not a coconut. Fruit of the Spirit is not a coconut. If you want to be a coconut, you might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the Spirit because the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do you think you have it? I got it. <laughs> 
I had a guy at Emmaus come up to me and, and, and said, I know what the fruit of the spirits are because I did that in an Emmaus meeting. And, and, and he, he said, I know what the fruit of the spirit are. And it's because of that little silly song. Because it helps, it helps to remember. Joy is part of the fruit of the spirit. Luke 11, 27 through 28, as Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. And he replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. I know another saying is, and do it. Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it or do it. Man, get into scripture. It's hard to obey what we don't know. We've got to get into Scripture so that, we, so that we can learn, so that we can obey and go where God would have us. We always get to choose how we're going to face the circumstances in this life. Everybody in here is going to face rough times. I'm sorry. It's true. Jesus said you'll have trouble in this world. He was right. Shocker. You know? <laughs> You're going to have trouble. But we can face it with fear or we can face with joy and gratitude together regardless of the thing that we're facing See, we're in for the long haul. 1 Peter 2. Friends, this world is not your home, so don't make yourselves cozy in it. This is from the message. Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. Live an exemplary life among the natives so that your actions will refute their prejudices. Then they'll be won over to God's side and be there to join in the celebration when he arrives. We have an incredible hope in Christ. It's what we have as followers of Christ. It's a beacon of light that carries us through the darkest of times. Those, those, those nights when we don't even know what we're going to do, that the beacon shines forward on a path that leads us to a new life that can only be found in Christ our Savior. Friends, this is not your home, so don't make yourselves cozy in it. Friends, this is not your home, so don't make yourselves cozy in it. I love the me- what the message does in that statement for those of us who are believers. When we were able to recognize that this place is not our home, it's not our true home, then we're given an opportunity to change our ideas about things like what success looks like. Maybe it doesn't look, look like a comparison game with others. Maybe it looks like helping other people to get on their feet, making a difference in people's lives. Realizing that the accumulation of material things is not as important as being a part of what God is doing, impacting lives through us. My friend Mark Ruiz, who died of cancer some years ago now, would ask himself this question, and and I've brought it here many, many times because it's so important, I think. He would ask himself this question. Going through cancer, he'd say, what is the eternal significance of whatever it was that he was going through? For him, it was that, that, uh, that was cancer, and the eternal significance of that, his answer was zero eternal significance to him. Zero. It had a temporary significance, but it didn't have an eternal one. He was set. He, had, he was a faith-filled man. He was going to heaven. He was going to be with Jesus. So he was going to have some temporary struggles with the treatments, and he went into remission and out of remission and experienced the return and the pain and struggle of the disease itself until it finally killed him. But it had zero significance eternally to him. And he'd tell you that on his deathbed. Didn't matter. It wasn't going to impact him and his relationship with God. It didn't have the power to do that. And that's because of today. That's because of Easter. It's because of what we celebrate on this day. It sets us free in a way that nothing else can. And I get how skeptics question the resurrection on his face because it were a pretty outlandish claim, right? We're claiming that somebody rose from the dead. The man was killed, put in a tomb. Rose from death on the third day, promised us the eternal life. Folks look at that and go on the face and they go, how does that make sense? And the answer is through faith. Through faith, it makes perfect sense. See, we couldn't get it done, so God sent his son for us. And without any evidence, the story would have died a long time ago. Did you know that God is smart? Really? So three of you do. That's not bad. God's smart, right? He's pretty sharp. Scripture tells us that 512 folks saw Jesus after the resurrection. Here's what that means. If we had each person that had witnessed the resurrected Lord come up here this morning and talk for 15 minutes, it'd be pretty miraculous because they're all dead. But, (laughs) sorry, that's my mind. 
If we gave them 15 minutes to give a testimony of what they had seen, heard, and experienced of Jesus after his death, to hear the testimony of all the people that Jesus appeared to, we'd be here all day and all night. But it wouldn't end there because we'd have to stick around through Monday and Monday night. Oh, and by the way, we'd have to stick through Tuesday and Tuesday night and Wednesday and Wednesday night and Thursday and Thursday night and sometime on Friday, they'd just be wrapping up the last testimony. God appeared to that many people. So Jesus appeared to that. So because he knows us, we're going to question everything. It would take 128 straight hours just to hear for 15 minutes each the testimony of those that saw the Lord after he rose. And we're called to be in this world, but not of the world, right? You've heard me describe the place of ministry in here, which would be at the margins. And so I, I came up with this little graphic to do that. So this is the world, right? So we're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. So there we are. We're in the world. But we're separate, right? We're not of the world. The world isn't, isn't dictating us. Here's the problem in the church. What we tend to do is this. Those are people. And instead of being at the margins, they move to the center of the church. So now we're not, we're, we're not even in the world anymore. We're in the church, and, and that's all we got. And nothing wrong with church fellowship. We need each other desperately. But that's not the place Jesus did his ministry because he did this. Everywhere we're the, on the edge of where the church meets the world, that's where ministry happens. That's where we're supposed to be in that place. It's supposed to be at the margins. It's one of the reasons why the, on the farmer's market we're going to open up so that we give free coffee so they can use the restroom so that they can know that we're here and know that we love them. Minister to people. Sacred and secular world can come together for a conversation. You know, but we have to invest in that conversation in order to get anyone to have one. And we believe, and I certainly believe, that is a directive of Christ to his church to be a part of bringing the sacred and the secular together. So let me close with this. You may have heard it before. How about this? Why don't you guys read that one to me? God is not a God of condemnation. If you have a voice of condemnation in your head, it's not from God, okay? Just know that. I say it a lot because it needs to be repeated a lot. You know, the voice of condemnation is either an old voice of our own or it's Satan trying to get to us. God is a God of salvation. God is a God of saving. And this love that God has for us is, <laughs> is incredible, and it's available to all of us. Even today, it's available, available to all of us. And I invite you into that love this morning. We're going to celebrate communion, but first, there's an empty tomb somewhere. Let me look. Hey, there it is. He is risen. <laughs>